the county requires data. Uh, we love data and recommendations on uh, our landscape makeup. Our current and our future plant palette. Our current and our future irrigation systems. Our staffing and our resource levels and then training for our staff. So we knew we identified that we needed to um, we needed data and information uh, on all these different uh, topics. So uh, when we talk about a landscape makeup, um, uh, the sites that we manage contain a variety of different landscape categories. A few examples would be uh, turf, mulch areas, a hardscape, shrubs, ground covers. So a, a landscape inventory was a deliverable that we needed for each site each of our our management sites uh, documenting the landscape types um, and this is going to help us estimate the labor materials and be able to plan for how we're going to improve sustainability water conservation and pest resistance then we need to know about what's our current plants and our current irrigation so to maximize pest resistance information on an, an existing plant palette was required right what do we currently have planted uh, and then it, information on our existing irrigation system. Um, we need the, these uh, basically maps to be created. Um, we had irrigation system maps. Some goes back to the 70s. Some look like they're a hand draw pencil by you know a, a, some irrigation worker that's long retired. So we had and some that were in the newer facilities were CAD ready uh, full drawings, but it was a, uh, it was very mismatched. The systems, the the plans. Um, we need a, a consistent set of information on what we currently have. Um, you know, also because the issue being that broken, malfunctioning, or poorly adjusted irrigation components can lead to pest issues. Then we needed recommendations on those plants and irrigation. How do we improve them? Uh, to implement the landscape changes, we needed a new uh, recommended plant palette. What were we what were we going to replace the old plant plants with? And we need a new recommended irrigation plants. Uh, how are we going to ensure that uh, our new sustainable plants are irrigated by an efficient leak free system that puts um, the, the correct amount of water for that uh, new plant palette? Uh, we need the landscape upgrade implementation, so um, we needed uh, planting maps to tell us uh, where to put these uh, the planting plant palettes The new planting palettes. We need these maps to tell us what goes in what area, depending on shade or um, uh, other uh, differences in the in the landscape. What are the uh, correct pallets to go for those particular areas? And then uh, irrigation efficiency, repair, maintenance, adjustment and upgrade recommendations were also needed. Uh, that included hydro zoning uh, to ensure that irrigation goes in the correct amounts to the correct areas. Uh, we needed updated labor materials and training requirements with completed landscape inventories recommendations. An updated labor and material study was also needed to assist the county in budgeting resources and completing the implementation, right? So we have this these recommendations, these new uh, planting plans, plant pallets, irrigation systems, but what's it going to take to get it installed? What's going to take to take care of it? Uh, both one time and ongoing. And then we also need to update uh, what do we need to, how do we need to train our staff to Take care of these new landscapes. We we have a lot of things we want to change. We want to transition, but um, we have to make sure that we uh, are effectively trained to take care of it and, and maintain it. Otherwise, we're going to lose that investment. Uh, a little background on landscape maintenance in the county. Um, for this project, only sites that managed by the county facilities and fleet department were considered. Uh, these are mainly. Uh, office campuses, medical clinics, operational facilities. Um, we're not going to see any county parks, county roads, or county airport landscapes in this. This is more what you'd figure, kind of your typical urban um, uh, public use landscape area. And currently a team of gardeners uh, provides regular landscape maintenance services on these, mostly at this time, mostly conventionally landscaped sites. That's how we're, we were currently operating and what we're hoping to transition away from. So there is what we need. 
And now let's look at what we already had, right? So we already had uh, quite a, a, a large number of usable assets when we started putting this together um, and, and seeing the more we can provide for the vendor, the less they have to collect and, and the easier their job's gonna be. So what we already had as a county, we already had aerial images. Of every site, we had aerial images, uh, and this uh, assists with um, mapping and some some identification as well, but uh, mainly with mapping, building footprints, and uh, things like that. We had existing landscape maps. As I mentioned before, there was um, you know we have uh, sites that were built uh, in, in I think 2017 was our newest site, and then we had things going all the way back to I think the 60s. So we had a, a, a large variety of different maps that we came with this. Um, but we did have some uh, existing uh, landscape maps, uh, which you can see this is one of the, the newer ones. We had existing irrigation plans. Same same idea with those varying quality levels. We had existing irrigation info. Uh, and this was interesting too. Some of these were just handwritten notes that uh, the guys that have been doing it for years had just kind of, you know, kept down what what timer did this and what valve did that. So no real kind of uh, no real um, uh, reliable way to pass on institutional knowledge. You know, if one guy retires, you could lose the whole idea of how an irrigation system uh, works in a, in a facility. Um, we had our site list. These are the sites that we wanted to complete. So we knew where we were going to do these. Uh, we had a plant list, uh, 858 species that uh, we gave the vendor said these these are plants that we would accept um, in terms of native status or um, water use um, that that we feel will be sustainable. Uh, so let's take a look at the different landscape plant and irrigation deliverables. There is the uh, existing landscape inventory. So this was a, uh, a task to create a new base map for each site that includes defined outlines and the square footage of those inventory landscape types that we had discussed. These were um, uh, turf, mulch, mulch areas with trees, ground cover areas, shrubs, hardscapes, parking lots, fire breaks, and then a, a general other category, and then plus outline the major structures. Uh, Chris, it seems like you just got muted. Can you unmute? Yes, that's strange. Um, where okay. where did it mute on? Um, I think it muted right as you transitioned to this slide. Okay. Um, so then, um, yeah, each uh, landscape type was color coded, and then each map included the specific square footage for that site. Um, which gave us something like this. So we get an idea, we can look at the landscape right away. We had an idea of how much hardscape we're dealing with, how much turf, how much uh, of the other different types of materials. Um, this really helps us plan uh, our labor. This really helps us uh, prioritize what sites we want to do first in terms of maybe reducing the amount of turf, reducing the amount of water usage, things like that. So um, uh, we're able to get an idea of of what our baseline types of, of landscapes are. We also needed our existing plant inventory. So this is to identify the existing plant palette, note the water use needs, the native status, and then a few various other details for each of the plants on these sites. What do we currently have planted here? Um, so we have this inventory for each site. You know, they listed the, uh, the plant name, the plant type, the water use, um, whether it's recommended to keep that plant or to replace that plant, uh, what the mature spread of that plant will be, what's the existing quantity of that plant, what's the total square footage that plant is taking up at this at this place right now. So at all 35 sites, we're able to see what, uh, what our current plants are, right? And what needs to be removed and what can we keep. Uh, then we need a recommended plant palette. So if we're, we're having recommendations to remove, what is recommended to replace those, right? So uh, recommended low water use of native plant pallets to replace existing pallets and to create a base map indicating where these pallets should go and to plan for efficient hydrozones and recommend a variety of qualified low water use species, right? We don't really want a monoculture. We want to make sure that we have uh, a variety of species um, 
uh, to help survivability and to help um, habitat and things like that. So uh, we have the recommended plant palette uh, with the plant name, the the uh, water use, um, the uh, exposure that it needs, the height, the width, the quantity that should be planted in each site, um, and the uh, the site use. Um, and then we have the recommended planting plant legends, right? So these areas give us an idea of what type of area is going to be. I'll show you in the map coming up, but so this is a, a color code so we can take a look at the map and see if we're going to replace, you know, the the turf area here. What type of area is this? OK, this is a grass replacement and then we can go back to the plants list and say, OK, what type of plants are the palette is 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 um, specified for grass replacement. So when we remove this turf, we know that that plant palette can then be placed in there. Uh, irrigation, existing irrigation, right? So to identify and verify our existing irrigation system operation, including meters, valves, controllers, and other types of irrigation equipment, um, and then create a new irrigation map for each site that identifies labels and locates the current irrigation system and gives us a consistent uh, way that we look at information. Um, so this is what we got. We got these existing irrigation plans. Uh, as you can see, the, the high existing hydro zones are here and we have our uh, all our components are, are mapped out so that um, if we did go to replace that that lawn area per se, we would know uh, what size of that line is coming in, where it's coming from, what controller does it go to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have our, our irrigation system components. Each uh, type of valve or sprinkler is all indicated in the map itself. Um, operational status, brand, um, those details are also included as well. The existing hydro zones are color coded and we understand the square footage of each hydro zone. And this, 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 this is important also when we talk about uh, trees uh, a little later. Um, and existing hydrogen details. So we can look up and know exactly what we're doing. As we change uh, the plants, we change the irrigation. As we change the irrigation, we need to change the hydro zones. So all this comes together. We don't want to get to a point where we didn't we didn't know that this was a half inch line and, and it wasn't supposed to be this. So we didn't know that we, when we cut that off, we also cut off this. So this gives us a complete idea of the picture of what we're doing uh, to ensure that we don't lose anything that we didn't want to lose. Um, so now we need recommended irrigation plants. So we know we have existing. So to create additional irrigation plants for all sites that provide necessary changes to serve the water use of the recommended plant pallets. So if we can give you these new recommended pallets, give us the irrigation changes that we need to implement as well. So also, <clears throat> we do this take into consideration how existing trees may have different water needs and may need to be irrigated exclusive of existing or replacement landscapes. Um, so we, 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 we told them that even if there is not a, um, if even if there is a, a landscape irrigation currently where the tree is not receiving the irrigation it should, then in the new irrigation plans, take that into place and, and, and let us know what needs to be done. If these trees need to be their own hydro zone, then put that in the recommendation. Uh, identify inefficient irrigation system components and provide recommendation on irrigation system efficiency. Um, you know, um, uh, weather uh, timers, uh, timers that will um, uh, uh, smart timers essentially that turn that can turn themselves to a lower level during uh, rain or or wet seasons and uh, increase the weather during uh, dry or hot seasons um, to prove efficiency. Um, bubblers uh, over sprayers, drip irrigation, subsurface irrigation, things like that. Uh, so this is the recommended irrigation plans. Um, letting us know, you know, where where for each area what's recommended to go in. Uh, recommended hydro zone layout. So these are the these would be the new hydro zones that they were recommending based on uh, the new plant palette. Uh, new recommended irrigation components to uh, replace what uh, uh, is there and may be broken or may be uh, inefficient or outdated. Uh, and new recommended uh, irrigation types. Um, you know, maybe they're, so they're recommending 47,000 square feet of drip irrigation for this particular place, uh, only 133 feet of spray. Um, you know, 
bubbler, four inch to a square feet. So what type of irrigation are we now going to um, use in that hydro zone? Um, so let's move into operations deliverables. So a labor and materials assessment. Uh, so we ask that they calculate the required labor materials necessary to update and also maintain current landscapes and also to implement and construct the recommended sustainable landscapes. And then deliver this in a, a database so that we had uh, an easy way to kind of uh, go by site uh, and, and say, OK, if we want to prioritize um, this see site A has the most turf, so we want to prioritize that. What's the cost in materials on that? What's the cost in labor? So we can kind of look at both the landscape types and the cost and use all those different um, variables to help us prioritize, make decisions. And, and also to help justify, because we can say we're removing this much turf from this area, water savings will be this much, et cetera. So that data also uh, comes along with, um, as, as we find the funds to transition to sustainable landscape, and you have to show the justification, you have to show the, the benefits of it as well. So the labor materials assessment, we ask for the considerable material required for maintenance, that's uh, fertilizer, string, trimmer string, et cetera. The hardware materials required for uh, the county landscape operations, vehicles, tools, irrigation parts. Uh, the labor required for maintenance, the number of gardeners, number of hours, frequency per week, et cetera. And then the labor required for the entire operation, uh, manager, supervisor, lead gardener, et cetera. And these were um, these were requested from our uh, facilities department uh, specifically. These these were the kind of numbers that they were looking for, and we got these um, databases back: labor required, materials required by site, uh, material cost for implementation. Um, kind of boring stuff, but we needed to have it right. This this is kind of the backbone where a lot of these decisions are based on. Uh, staffing level recommendations, recommendations and timelines for transitioning from these existing staff levels to recommended staff levels. If, again, if we're changing things, do we need um, more gardeners? We need less gardeners because now it's sustainable and it's it's designed to have uh, less maintenance work. You know, we so we needed to know that as well. Um, provide uh, also recommendations on the frequency, type and resources for staff training and certifications required to maintain. Um, again, what do we need to know to, to make sure that these are taken care of properly? Um, recommended staff trainings included um, the recommendations for the rescape maintenance professional training, um, the irrigation technician certification, uh, and th these wouldn't be for all staff. They, this, this would be varying. Uh, most staff you'd want maintenance professional, most staff you want irrigation technician, some staff you want irrigation auditor certification, uh, maybe one person on staff you want landscape water management certification, uh, but these were what they recommended uh, at least be um, available to the staff, the people with these certifications. Uh, we also asked for some concept plan deliverables which was uh, 10 general landscape plans to use as templates. Um, uh, just kind of a, a basic, if we're gonna do a building entrance, here's here's what you can do. You can plant some of these plants, um, a lawn replacement. Here's just a kind of a quick, so a bit of a template that that our guys can follow to give them a head start on doing some of this work. A parking lot, a road median. Here, here's a couple of pictures and here's some examples. This just to help them not be as intimidated by doing some of these um, these changes. Uh, implementation status. Um, the estimated cost was 10.7 million, but that didn't include uh, any design or permitting or other costs. And the uh, seed facilities began requesting the funds in fiscal year 21 22. And implementation is currently in progress on a side by side basis. And as you always, county budgets may impact these projects. Uh, we also want to spend a quick time on tree care and outreach efforts. Trees are an important part of landscapes. When you transition to a sustainable landscape and you choose to do a water efficient landscape, you want to make sure that you note that existing trees can often have different water needs from this new surrounding vegetation. And trees that do not receive enough water are susceptible to pest issues. Um, 
when we want to talk about tree management to understand uh, baseline county tree, to tree conditions to monitor tree health and um, to assist in goal and target setting. The county did conduct a parks wide and facility wise tree inventory uh, and to facilitate departmental collaboration and consistency. We did create a ecology based tree management guide. This is a little bit of our tree inventory map. It shows the location of all inventory trees on county facilities. It also gives us individual tree data. It also gives individual tree benefits as well as collective tree benefits. We can get the benefits of an entire site if we want, or just one particular tree, or all of the trees that the, that the parks manages. Uh, and this is our ecology-based tree management guide. It, it's a 125-page uh, guide uh, giving us a clear, consistent, um, uniform uh, best management practices and vision for how we manage trees uh, in the county. Um, we also have the County Sustainable Landscape website. It's to educate and promote sustainable landscaping to county employees, to residents, and to businesses. It has information on the county's water efficient landscape ordinance, information on the Bay Friendly principles, which were adopted in 2016 as part of the county's sustainable landscape policy. And it has uh, training modules instructing on the uh, exploration, design, implementation, and maintenance of sustainable landscaping. Um, there's a few. Um, shots of the website, the Bay Friendly Principles that are we learn about in the website, uh, the training modules we go through, learn about how to uh, design your site, implement your site, maintain your site, do sustainable landscaping. We also uh, wanted to briefly bring in our integrated pest management website, which uh, is to inform and educate residents and businesses on the integrated pest management program and the, um, the county the county program as well as integrated pest management in general. And thank you very much. That will be all that I have. Thanks very much, Chris. Shall we pass it along to Nourish and then have Q&A afterwards? Does that sound good? Let me take a minute to transition from Chris. Okay, Shoba, please let me know if you're able to see the slide deck here. I am, yes. It's All right, not in presentation you. mode, but I can see the PowerPoint file. All right. Okay, first and foremost, I would like to thank San Francisco inviting us, sharing our experience, and uh, learn more from all of you to make it better. What I would discuss now here is that Chris has given you a kind of a, a glance on exactly the 35 plus uh, landscaping sites we have and how we are trying to make a transition from a conventional landscape to a sustainable landscape. As you all imagine how it's going to look like in the future, probably you must have seen a lot of colorful photographs on the www web browsers all across the world. What is covered in my presentation today is information and resources on pest prevention, detection, and low impact control methods in urban gardens and landscapes. There's a reason I try to basically separate these two because I discussed with the uh, Shoba this morning, not knowing exactly the caliber. Uh, many of you are expert in your field. Some of you are you just novice gardeners at home, and uh, there's a in between. So I, there's a big wide range of audience. I just wanted to make sure this thing that not all can be covered in one given 45 minutes. So I try to focus on exactly how this new landscape is going to look like and what will be our current priorities, what we'll be handling at that time as far as pests are concerned. So this is what is covered here. The seedling care, common sap feeding insects, lawn beetles, fleas and cutworms plant diseases, mold, fungi, and microbial infections, soil-bound pathogens, 
then aphids and other tiny pests, slugs, snails, earwigs, these are the weed eaters there, soil borne pathogens and pesticidal agitinets. nets. And what's not covered here is information and resources on weeds, vertebrate pests, trees and shrubs. These can be explored later at some other given time. This image on the right side that gives you kind of a perspective what that conventional landscape is going to look like in the county as well as in your neighborhoods in the near future. Probably in the next five to 10 years, you would see as we get into from Mediterranean climate to the semi-arid conditions, more and more turf is going to be taken out and it's going to be replaced with a diverse plant palette. And just having a diverse plant palette, imagine if I have diverse amount of vegetables within my refrigerator, so I'm just going to go after each and every one on a daily basis. The same thing applied to the pests also. With having this kind of a succulent, diverse plant palette, we are also inviting a different variety of pests, which I'm hoping to cover today. I would like to acknowledge here the script outline, text, information, images, and other resources for this presentation are adopted from following resources. And this is only for the educational purposes. There's no commercial use recommended or suggested for this presentation. The first and foremost, and Chris has already given you, it took us almost three years to understand exactly how we're going to transition from a conventional landscape to a sustainable landscape. A lot of studies, a lot of details, a sweat has gone into this thing to come up with this such, such a comprehensive document in which our facility is now implementing one site at a time. Choose the right plant. If you're choosing the right plant, that alone can make the big difference. If that plant is native, probably it has more chance and more vigor to grow better in our climate and also fight back with the different disease, different pests. And the plant should be appropriate for the climate zones and the site microclimatic conditions noted in site analysis. The wind, the shade, moisture. There are many pre-designed plant palettes for San Francisco, which are already given in one of your department's website for fog belt and for the sun belt. I will share all this information with you as San Francisco is going to have access to this presentation. I have basically referenced and hyperlinked each and every document here. So the, for the first document, let me just take you there how it's going to look like. As you can see, you can just refer to the document and have more details inside and work within your own area. Let me take you back now to the presentation. The plant should be appropriate for the topography and soil types. Refer to the soil laboratory tests or soil infiltration and texture tests performed during the site surveys. For any significant landscape installation, laboratory soil testing is strongly recommended, especially when you're dealing with a large campus. It is important that you have multiple randomized testing for different areas based on your hydrozones, based on the plant palette you're going to bring into their areas, those sites. And the plant list should include a wide variety of species, as Chris mentioned earlier. You need you don't want to create certain monocultures because those are cookie cutter solutions can lead to serious pest problems in the future. Plant diversity can create stable communi communities of complementary plants with varying characteristics. A more diverse landscape has greater resistance to failure due to pests and diseases. Choose plant groupings that share similar irrigation needs that locate them, then locate them together in areas called hydrozones, where their similarities allows them to be watered with maximum efficiency. Before this presentation, I took an opportunity to just visit San Francisco. I often don't go out of my area, my territory, but I thought why not just to have a look into the plant palette. I was very close to the peers and some of the plant pellets I looked into those areas. There's so much of diversity there, but there's also an invasive nature of the plant diversity. I highly suggest to look into your area of operations. If you are a homeowner, look into something that is native. 
local to that area than bringing exotic plants from other areas because that brings many other many kind of pest problems which we are going to encounter soon once we have all these sustainable landscapes as i said here exclude invasives non native species high water use and otherwise ecologically problematic plant types take care not to choose or retain plants that do not follow suit it is very common yes we do have resources in some areas you will find that we have enough abundance of money we can bring in plant palette from china we can bring plant palette from india we can bring from many many other because we have we do have resources but that is not what is suggested for a sustainable landscape in san francisco plant selection should be considered to the ultimate size of the plant when mature especially trees for example do not choose tall species for planting under wires and lines because that will create many many pest problems not alone just you may have to incur a huge cost in pruning and plant list should be include deer pest resistant species to reduce need for pesticides and other pest control measures should you include species that are known to attract beneficial insects birds and other animals other animals please do so choose alternatives to high water use turf grass and lands lawns in reality i highly suggest if you are not looking for a landing spot i call it landing donuts in case of an emergency is highly recommended that look for changing that lawn into a landscape of diverse plant pet this is what we are trying to do in san, uh, in san jose in santa clara county also all 35 facilities as per the board mandate it is likely we will not have a single one square foot under lawn in the near future the goal is to remove all the lawns because that is not needed under the water conservation principles and scarcity of the water which we are experiencing now at the same time a water thirsty lawn invites pest problems the pathogens finding your mi microclimate this is one of the resource that is from san francisco public works department within san francisco you will notice that there are few sections of foggy and sunny neighborhoods the foggy delhi city colma pacifica and many other areas in between areas some part of san francisco like glen park the hate western addition sunny areas of brisbane burlingame san mateo so look into the climate zones and based on that design your landscape using the plant list we do have our own plant list we do have our own database for south valley and san francisco also has an excellent site it's called san francisco plant finder if you are designing a landscape in your area look into the san francisco natives habitat plants look into the plant that is more suited to the storm water retention areas look into the sidewalk landscaping is an excellent choice is given there and a very well vetted peer reviewed at the scientific level another source of choosing plant list is this database which we have used and let me share that with you you can create your own list right from here you can go a little more detail into a plant landscape if you are looking for certain galleries you can go to the galleries and you you can look into exactly how that plant landscape is going to look like you can select certain plants you can have tours of certain areas a golden garden tour you can read more about each and every plant palette how that's going to transition over time scale this is an excellent site but i highly recommend you can just go for visuals whatever kind of landscape you're looking for but then i highly recommend that you follow the san francisco finders plant list finder to select the plants that are most suited for the san francisco now once you have built your plant list or a plant palette where to find it 
where to buy those. As I said that I encourage to, for you to invest more into the native plants and for San Francisco County, the Bay Natives, San Francisco nursery, as well as the candlestick native plant nursery are the ideal source to uh, purchase uh, native plants for your area. This is another resource that you should also explore that do not look into planting either edibles or the general landscaping plants other than the season. These two excellent resources will give you a guidance from January all the way to the December, when to look for the seedlings, when to plant those in the in the ground, and what not to do. Excellent resources to choreograph your annual planting season. There are more resources given at the San Francisco uh, Public Works Department and the Water Power Sewer Department. And you can go there and have a little more explore more about the plant uh, plant fighter, gardening tips, pest control tips, water wise gardening. So many, many good resources are given within your own county. Now let me transition to a conventional landscape to a sustainable landscape. The first and foremost. From pest management perspective is seedling care. Seeds can be started indoors beginning in February. Get a jump on the spring. Using plants lights with increased growth significantly. Use can you can plant an early set of seedlings and then at later in May to stagger harvest time for some crops. So I'm just trying to give you a flavor of both a landscaping plant palette that is just aesthetic, the floriculture, the ornamental horticulture, and also the gardens, a combination of both because there's a diverse audience out there. So I just cannot differentiate right from the edible gardens all the way to the landscapes for aesthetic values. Always start with the sterile potting medium. Now, where do you get the sterile potting medium? If you are just a home gardener, if you're just looking for 500 to 1000 square feet of a landscape, then you can create your own potting medium. This is from the University of Oregon. An excellent site how to create your potting medium. Between 500 to 1000 square feet of land, you can really create within your own. Then if you have to look for a large landscapes. On those acreage, probably you can buy and you can source out from the local nurseries. Now, seedlings may be fertilized at a time with a slow release or organic fertilizer, such as seaweed extract or fish emulsions. Seedlings and young plants set outside in late spring and summer are favorite food for snails, slugs, earwigs, and caterpillars. You can use copper tape placed in a circle around seedlings or the bottom of the pots to deter slugs and snails. These are simple things that you can do compared to using any other pesticide that can harm the environment. If damping off, uh, damping off starts to occur, rotting of the stem or soil surface, increase air circulation. Simply bring a fan. Just increase the air circulation in that area so that you can take out the moisture under the canopy of that uh, landscape. Try not to apply water directly on the seedlings and allow the soil to in the tray to dry on the surface between waterings. And the seedlings can be grown in an open environment in your backyard, and these can be grown into in a kind of a, a semi greenhouse. Let's talk about some of the common sap feeding insects. First and foremost, always identify your pest first. For large holes, look for signs of droppings or hunt at the nighttime with a flashlight. Look on leaf undersize, usually for sucking pests like mealybugs, scale insects, if it's true bugs and white flies. When releasing predators and parasites, this is a biological control. Insects such as ladybugs or lacewigs, make sure that you, your ant population is under control because ants are in a symbiotic relationship with 
many of these insects. They are fetching honeydew in, in, in return. They are protecting these insects. A sticky barrier around the main trunk can prevent ants to climb up. And once they are not protected, other predators and parasitoids can take care of these harmful insects. The best time to release ladybugs is around dusk or before dawn. Water the area beforehand and keep the insects container in the refrigerator before release. There's a reason for it. Once you release these predators or the parasitoids, if they are in an active form, as soon as they release, they'll go off site. The best thing is to keep them in a refrigerator. It's kind of a, almost calming down the insect and once you release it and they find the food source, they can feed on that. Now, here is a comparison between a ladybugs and lacewigs. Lacewigs larvae are the most effective beneficial insects for managing sucking pests, including aphids, mites, thrips, small caterpillars, and many, many more. Whereas ladybugs are excellent for greenhouse applications, and these are commercially available ladybug lures, will help the commercially available lady, ladybug lures once in a greenhouse environment where the plume is being created, will retain the ladybugs in that environment, highly unlikely in an open environment. For lawn beetles, grubs and fleas and cutworms, you may use beneficial nematodes. Encourage beneficial bugs to visit your gardens by planting flowers that attract beneficial insects. Some of the examples are calendula, alisum, marigold, purple coneflower, yarrow. These are very common in your area. For molds, fungi, and microbial infections. Molds and fungi are common problems in San Francisco foggy climate. Your temperature, as well as the fog and the moisture, atmospheric moisture, is almost, I would say, 40% more than the Santa Clara Valley where we live. Molds can affect almost any plant tissue can range from white to black, can vary in appearance from shiny and smooth to more familiar fuzzy forms. Ensure you that you are able to identify it properly. If not, just take it to the local nursery. Any sample you have, they'll be able to assist you in that. Sometimes molds and fungi and their effects, they look like almost similar to the abiotic disorders of lawns and landscape plants. Abiotic disorders are not caused by biological agents, such as insects and mice. So please ensure that you are able to differentiate between these two, a microbial infection as well as the abiotic disorders. Powdery mildew causes a white, splotchy growth on peas, beans, and similarly on many floriculture of of flowers. In this case, I have shown you an image of a rose affected by the powdery mildew. Remove infested leaves and leaf litter around affected plants. Control can be accomplished with many commercially available non-toxic organic sprays such as neem oil. Similar to powdery mildew, which is a, a, diff, a different, is called downy mildews. Downy mildew requires moist, humid conditions, very common to the San Francisco. It causes angular purple, red, and brown spots on leaves that will eventually cause the leaf to turn yellow and drop. To control downy mildews, provide good air circulation. That is more than adequate to take care of downy mildew in a 500 to 1,000 square foot gardens or in nurseries. Adequately space plants and prune host canopies and nearby and overhead vegetation. Avoid wetting foliage, use drip or low volume micro sprinklers instead of overhead irrigation systems. 
promptly remove and dispose of infected foliage to reduce pathogen in a clone. As you can see here, I'm just trying to bring some understanding to all of you. In any case, whether it's a powdery mildew or a downy mildew or any other microbial infections, it is unlikely you will engage a chemical intervention to solve a problem, a fungicide or a miticide or an insecticide to take care of these issues. Just simple cultural modifications, it's taking care of your irrigation, the moisture in the environment, that alone can solve many, many of these issues. General IPM guidelines to minimize disease. In experimental designs, use of vermicompost tea claimed to help suppression of root and foliar pathogens, arthropods, and nematode pests. There's an excellent guidance manual on it. My sorry, and you can read more about how a vermicompost tea is applied to take care of many of the pest issues. However, I just wanted to caution you here that regardless of these claims, compost teas are not registered as pesticides. So they cannot legally be applied to control insects or biotic disease in a landscape setting. In 2009, before this document was published, compost tea was widely available in the marketplace. And we did apply in the Sycamore Plaza in the county government center. There were over 40 trees had anthracnose and had the powdery mildew. In anticipation, that's going to take care of the anthracnose and it's going to take care of the powdery mildew. It did. It did work. But that was not the function. That was not the legal function of a compost tea. What compost tea did, a foliar application and the subsurface application of the compost, what it did, it helped sycamore plants or sycamore trees to have the vigor to fight back. So if I have to state it here, this is not to say that compost tea don't help a place, have a place in the landscape or toolbox. All current research to date shows compost tea to be a good natural delivery tool for a quick boost of nutrients. If you are able to apply a foliar application of a compost tea, vermicompost tea, that can help to Im improve the vigor of the plant to fight back with the disease, but it is not meant to control the disease. Other important part of the uh, minima to minimize diseases, remove severely diseased leaves and stems as soon as you notice them. Don't wait. Clean up the leaf litter around diseased plants frequently as well. If nearly an entire tree or shrub is diseased, prune off infected positions, portions immediately and ensure that you always rinse tools when you're hopping from one tree or one plant to other so that you're not adding a cross-contamination and causing the disease to spread. If an area of your garden is significantly affected by disease, its prudence is there to rotate entirely. A different family of annual flowers, a different family of vegetables, bulbs into the next season. Tie up the plants so that you can create more aeration underneath it. Provide maximum air circulation. If you really have to have a force aeration, bring a fan out outwards. To avoid plant damage, if you really have to use a chemical, always test spray certain areas before you go for a wide spectrum chemical application. If it's an other tiny pest detections, Shoba, please keep me on time also. Will do. You're good for now. Thank you. Yep. Many tiny insects feed on plant juices and may not be noticed until they cause serious plant damage. If you are a professional gardener, I'm sure that that is your job. You're eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. You're always there. So the early detection is a key. Instead of eating whole, instead of eating holes in plants, these pests suck juices from plant and can limit flowering, fruit product production, cause irregular 
looking le le leaves in birds or transmit plant disease. Your best way to leave some of the eyes on the ground is blue and yellow sticky traps that can help you to have an early detection. And these insects are aphids, the white flies. Aphids are small, green, yellow, red, or gray soft bodied insects, often found in clusters and growing tips, flower birds, leaf undersides, and enclosed plant parts. If it remain unchecked, aphid population can grow within three or four days to an extent that it can cause a serious drop of the fruit production. White flies resembling white ash flakes occur on the underside of the leaves and cause yellowing, sil silvering, or tiny black spots You also have the scale insects. Another tiny scale, they, these, they can stunt the growth. Trips feed with buds, flood up leaves, and closed plant parts. Their damage is often observed before they can, they can be seen. Spider mites, they look like tiny black dots that cause leaf curls and some light stippling of leaves. For more information, you can, I have given you the source on the right hand side, the University of California IPM, and you can go one insect at a time and learn more about it. But for control, there are simple cultural practices you can follow and resolve these issues. Do not over fertilize. If it's white flies and scale insects are attracted to new growth, the juicy succulent growth encouraged by the quick release of the high nitrogen fertilizers. They will also reproduce faster by feeding on the excess plant sugars these fertilizers induce. Use slow release or organic fertilizers such as compost, fish emulsions, or kelp meals. Be sure plants are not underwatered either, as this makes them more attractive to these tiny pests. If you only find a few simply squash these aphids, white flies, or scales. If you spot a colony of aphids or white flies, spray it off with simple water, hose it off. And on trees, sometimes you'll find large population of these tiny insects. Use a power gun, a power wash. Just clean up as soon as you notice them. Once they're dropped on the ground, you can minimize the infestation. Pinch or prune off badly infested portions of the plant. Consider pruning larger plants open so that birds and predatory insects can reach the pests. Now, these, the, as I mentioned earlier, that these tiny insects, they have a symbiotic relationship with the ants. If you're releasing the predators and parasitoids, and ants are in that environment, basically it's going to limit your control using the biological methods. So ensure the ants are not reaching out to protect these insects. To do that, wrap the tree trunk or the plant stalk with a brown paper, then apply a sticky barrier over the paper. A tangle foot application is a trademark. Benefit insects such as lacewig, ladybugs feed on these tiny pests. Release them in garden before problem arise. Once it saturates that area, they are familiar with that environment and they do have some source to feed on. They will multiply much faster and it will stay within that environment. Encourage these natural predators with plants that attract them, such as wildflowers. Slugs, snails, earwigs, caterpillars, and some beetles. Naresh, can I interject real quick? Uh, can you wrap up in about five minutes so we have enough time for discussion? Yes, I do. Thank okay, you. Thanks. So, as I said, early detection is essential. Look for the signs of these slugs, snails, earwigs. I have given you some of the tips here in this presentation. You can read more about it.
If you notice common white or yellow butterflies, very important. These butterflies are not the good butterflies. These are moths. They can really cause a serious damage to the crops, especially the cabbage family. Let me take you to the last part of the presentation here. The soil bond pathogens. Now, many of the plant diseases, they originate from a contaminated soil. Very important that these diseases which are root rot, damping off, are, which are related to a, a soil bond pathogen, because of the overwatering and poorly drained soils. So please ensure when you're designing your landscapes, as Chris mentioned earlier, that landscape is only feeding the water to the targeted areas, not overly watered. That alone can make the difference for your landscape to survive many, many years to come. Some of these gray molds, and the canoes are the reason because we have contaminated landscapes. We have brought soil from different areas or the landscape already had that kind of pathogen inside. And because of the overwatering, as I mentioned earlier, the poorly drained soils, that fungus continues to sustain there and continues to basically haunt us. So the best thing is to do is to look for, let me just take you to the next part of the soil bond pathogens. In warmer climates, which is in the Santa Clara Valley here, not in the San Francisco, uh, solarization is one process that it, you can use to disinfect the soil. Whereas in case of San Francisco, what you can do is heating the soil is one of the effective method to take care of uh, these pathogens before you plant anything. I think with that, I'm going to stop here for questions. There's more to show here, but uh, with the limitation of time, uh, I'm just going to stop my presentation here. Let me take you to the last slide. Then. Thank you. Thanks, Shobha. Thank yeah, thanks so much. I'm going to give you some virtual applause here. I appreciate your resource-packed presentation, both you and Chris.